Well, it's nice to see everybody tonight. And I figured I'd start for the moment from the ARL radio laboratory. So I am sitting in or standing in this new space. I am located right now at ARL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut, a very snowy day here. There's probably uh, a new 12 inches of snow on the ground, uh, but they cleared it up by noontime and I was able to get in here just fine. Um, but I'm, the space I'm in is W1HQ, Whiskey One Hotel, Quebec, but it's a very special new place at ARL headquarters. This is the ARL Radio Laboratory, an innovation laboratory for sort of the shack of the future. And I thought I'd start the presentation here tonight because I wanted to sort of talk to you a little bit about how ARL is pushing the bounds of uh, the norms of amateur radio. Uh, we're going to talk about new vocabulary in amateur radio. We're going to talk about growing amateur radio. But even behind me here, you see a space that's unlike most radio shacks. Um, the space is very familiar, a small room. A lot of universities, uh, radio clubs have a small space where they can organize a shack. But what we've done here is created an entire integrated station. Uh, instead of putting the radios like we see them in many ham radio sh shacks all stacked up, uh, they are actually mostly rack mounted in two equipment racks on either side of me. A lot of what you see on the benches is pretty stark, and that's because much of the station is integrated uh, using Raspberry Pi, node red workflows. Uh, you'll see a lot of monitors. The hope in the future is that with a tablet, we'll be able to do all of our antenna switching from a tablet. We're using um, a green heron switching for the antennas, getting a new tower on top of the roof here. This is not just so that the staff at ARL headquarters can have a lot of fun in here although it is a lot of fun in here, but it's an extension of the ARL laboratory, which is well known for product review testing. In this space, we'll be able to take a radio that was uh, tested for product review for QST, and we'll be able to put it on the air in our integrated station. Uh, what's an integrated station? Well, we use uh, a Raspberry Pi, we use uh, microcontrollers throughout, we use uh, remote switching, we use all different types of networking to see if the ham radio gear that we're testing integrates well with the shack of the future. This is um, hopefully something that will inspire a lot of other radio amateurs to say, geez, I can do this at home. I could get a couple of equipment racks or um, we wanted it to look very wireless. So you'll notice a black band that runs around the room. That's our, our wireless uh, uh, wire networking system. All it is is hiding the wires, and there's some posts behind there to, uh, to help um, hide all of the wiring. But it's a relatively easy thing we were able to do to create the illusion of wireless in here as well. So the space is very exciting. You're going to start to see a lot of content produced in this space from ARL headquarters. And again, it's intended to inspire us to think about breaking down the norms of how antenna, excuse me, how station design form and function are integrated. I'm gonna now walk over to uh, the Aero Media Studio very quickly, and I'm gonna pick up my rest of my presentation in that space. So um, I hope you enjoyed this opportunity to see the Aero Radio Laboratory. It's new, no one's really seen this space yet. We've just started to leak it out. This is really the first time we've presented from in this space. So I think that's pretty special for the Dayton Amateur Radio Association tonight. Now, give me just a second. I'm going to walk down the hall. OK, now hopefully you can hear me in this other space. Thumbs up. All right, excellent. Well, it's great to be here with the Dayton Amateur Radio Association uh, meeting this evening. Again, I'm Bob Inderbitson, and it's so nice to see you all. I know I know a lot of you. I know Ron, and I know Jack, and I know um, uh, Elizabeth, and so many people from, uh, from the group. I see uh, our Vice Director Scott Yonnelly on. Uh, there's just so many of you. I, 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 uh, Rick Allnut, thank you all for being here tonight, and Happy New Year to you all. Uh, let me see if we can cycle through the slides here.
Okay, so the presentation that we're doing today is called Growing Amateur Radio. And again, I'm Bob Inderbitz and the Director of Public Relations and Innovation at ARL Headquarters. This is what ARL Headquarters looks like when the weather's nice, and it doesn't look like that today. And a little bit about my journey through amateur radio, right? Because we're hams, we have to understand a little bit about uh, where we've come from. Uh, how many folks on here are familiar with the Radio Shack 150 projects in one? You know, it was experiences like this of playing with electronics that really interested me in amateur radio, uh, first electronics and then radio electronics. And my father had a big influence on that as well. So I joined the ARL staff in 1991, but I've actually been a ham since 1982. I got started in middle school. Uh, Kilo Alpha 2 Papa Zulu Delta was my original call sign. And uh, th this uh, coming up in May, I'll be on the staff for 31 years, so a long time. And I had a lot of hair a long time ago. So my... Uh, my role at ARL headquarters is quite diverse. Uh, I, I manage product development, public relations and media, outreach, the Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative, and, uh, and I co-coordinate ARL's presence at conventions and HamFest. And the Dayton um, Hamvention is of particularly uh, special in my heart, and I'll tell you why. When I started working at ARL in 1981, uh, I was working in the VEC department. I was a kid. I was excited to be working at ARL headquarters. And I asked permission of one of the other departments if I could go to Hamvention and help out with the ARL table. Back then, ARL had a table at Hamvention, nothing much more than, than that. And I really wanted to go. And they said, sure, if you can get there, we'll, uh, we'll feed you. So I said, geez, what can I do? I called up my dad and he said, I've got some frequent flyer miles for you. So he he uh, gave me a ticket. I got to the airport and I found out they weren't transferable. So I used my credit card for the very first time in my life, bought a ticket. And so I can say that I used a credit card for the first time to buy a plane ticket to get to Dayton Hamvention. And I had the most fun and I haven't missed one since 1991. And I operate ham radio like many of you. I have a lot of fun on weekends with ham radio. In the summertime, I, I travel to Cape Cod. That's a picture of Cape Cod up there. And I operate from the famous Marconi Beach uh, on, the, on the bluffs of the beach there to uh, which a long time ago had these big towers. You can actually still see these, uh, the, the footings for these towers being lapped away by the ocean. Uh, much of that bluff is underwater these days, but you can still see some of the wood there uh, at, the, at the Marconi site on Cape Cod. But I go and operate there for fun and set up at the visitor's uh, lookout there and act like a professor helping introduce the general public to amateur radio. So there's my fishing pole antenna set up there on the beach overlooking the, uh, the, the beautiful uh, ocean. And uh, nothing fancy, you know, I brought my IC7300 and my sunglasses and my microphone and my antenna and set it all up and spent most of the afternoon just enjoying operating and, and talking to visitors who are wondering what amateur radio is all about. I'm also getting into Raspberry Pi a little bit and uh, having fun integrating my station with a Raspberry Pi computer controller. And I uh, take that portably with my, my portable ham radio station out into the field. That's uh, just a park that's a couple miles from my, my apartment. And I used my magnetic loop and I got on the uh, digital modes with, uh, with the Raspberry Pi, everything controlled with a uh, LiPo battery. So I'm having a lot of fun with uh, amateur radio in new ways as many people are who are getting active in parks on the air and chasing lighthouses and operating outdoors in general and FT8, just so much you can do with amateur radio these days. But you came here to learn a little bit about growing amateur radio from somebody who has heard a lot of things going on in amateur radio for a long time. You know, there's 3 million radio amateurs worldwide, about 750,000 of them in the US. 
That's 30,000 new hams that come into amateur radio each year because of our terrific uh, volunteer examiner program uh, in the United States. There's no shortage of people coming into ham radio every year, no shortage at all. And by the way, anybody who tells you that next year is the end of amateur radio, they told me that next year was the end of amateur radio when I got a license. They scared me that the end of amateur radio was in 1991 when I started at Aero headquarters. And always the threat that's shared with me is that, geez, we're an aging demographic. Well, I want you to know that uh, that's not gonna go away. Uh, uh, the, the demographic in amateur radio is one that leans towards the older end of the equation. The question is, are we planting enough seeds with young people and, and uh, new licensees? I would take a database full of 30 and 40 year olds becoming amateur radio operators. Uh, 50 year olds, no problem. So uh, the, the uh, rumors of the end of days of amateur radio are just that, they're just rumors. And uh, again, take it from somebody who's been very close to outreach and recruitment for many, many years. Uh, there's no shortage of new people coming into amateur radio. The question is, what are we doing with those new people? So I studied very closely uh, with the help of a, a, a third party researcher called Redex that worked with ARL to do a very significant national study. Actually, they do a national study for ARL about once every 10 years. And we dig really deep into the data and we try to find out why people become amateur radio operators. And they largely become amateur radio operators for one of these two reasons or both. That's why I sort of set this up as a Venn diagram. They become amateur radio operators because they want to be involved in public service or they're interested in the technology or both. And it's not so much public service, it's more of a, I want to save the world, probably closer to emergency communications, right? But in amateur radio, there's a rush to licensing. A lot of people get their license really quick, but they don't pass um, any of the necessary steps to really get to understand radio, to explore radio electronics, to uh, train in emergency communications to really understand the full capability of our amateur radio service. And that's where our radio clubs come into play. Uh, our radio clubs, ARL, mentors, YouTube channels. There's so many different ways to learn about the amateur radio service and become active. But growing amateur radio begins with the gift of this 30,000 new hams each year. So before anybody starts to imagine that the end of days is here, Say to yourself, what should we be doing with those 30,000 new hams that land in our lap every year? I think it comes down to these couple of uh, things on the screen here. Get involved, get on the air, and get radioactive. There are so many different facets to amateur radio these days that there's many different, many, many different things. Remember that Venn diagram I shared, public service and technology? If somebody comes into amateur radio and they come into our radio club and, they're, and they test to, to get their amateur radio license and they walk out that door after passing their VE exam and we didn't have an opportunity to ask them what they're interested in, public service or technology or both. If we, if we miss that opportunity, we've missed an opportunity to nurture that one out of 30,000 uh, new licensee. And what if they say they're interested in public service? then we onboard them. We onboard them into activities that they might be interested in. Uh, we might introduce them to a field day site as a way of just getting on the air. We might introduce them to training opportunities with the local ARIES or other MCOM groups. We might help them get a handheld real quick to get on the air so they can practice the art of on the air communications. We might encourage them to upgrade their license quickly to general class because we know that people who upgrade to general, get active on HF, uh, become more active in amateur radio than anybody that's in that database. Somebody once told me, you know, there's a lot of validity in the technician license. I'm so glad they created that no code technician license. And I said, yeah, but was that an end to the, to, to, to the licensing or is that a first step? Because when we look at the number of people who are active in the amateur radio emergency service, and I pull that data, a significant portion of them are general and extra class licensees, not technician licensees. 
So again, the question is, what are we doing to interest and plug in new technician licensees, nurture them to become general class licensees, and get them involved on the air and radioactive? So some of what we're doing at ARL right now involves practicing a new vocabulary. And this can be a little bit awkward in the beginning when you're practicing a new way to talk about things. And I want you all to know that nothing on the screen here says that we're throwing something out at all. We're just trying some new things. So the old vocabulary was ham radio, book, radio club, licensing, QST, members. The new vocabulary is radio communications, learning, community, getting radioactive involved and engaged. Again, not licensing as an end to the, to the means, but licensing as a means of becoming radioactive involved and engaged. And we don't talk just about QST anymore. We talk about content. We don't talk just about members, but member volunteers, people who take the next step beyond just being a paying dues member of an organization and become leaders in amateur radio. Uh, they're running YouTube channels. They're presidents of radio clubs. They run ham radio conventions. They are SECs, section emergency coordinators and section managers or peer among peers. They're board members of the ARL. These are all member volunteers. Uh, they run road races and other activities to get people on the air and to cr create community connections for amateur radio uh, in, in the local community. They help people get on the air by going over to their house and helping them get an antenna up. They instruct, they do volunteer examinations. Those are the types of people that ARL wants to fill its membership database with, member volunteers. And you know, QST and books were the old way of learning, the only way of learning. Today, ARL members have four magazines Every member can open up the digital edition of QST on the air magazine uh, that was introduced at the beginning of 2020 and it's extremely popular or 21, excuse me, beginning of 21. It's celebrating its first year uh, on the air magazine. So on the air magazine, um, NCJ, the National Contest Journal, every member can open up the digital edition and learn about radio sport through the National Contest Journal. QEX, every member can open up the digital edition of QEX magazine and push their own understanding of radio technology and, and where the uh, hobby is going from a uh, technological standpoint. Uh, some of the smartest people I know are writing for QEX magazine. And books is not the end all anymore for ARL. We're, we're uh, pushing the boundaries of learning and education. All members of ARL now have access to a learning hub called the ARL Learning Center. Uh, that hub is filled with online courses, streaming content, videos, multimedia instruction. You don't have to scour YouTube to try to figure out which programs are good and which programs are not good that you should be following. Although there's a lot of really good stuff on YouTube, many of them are actually contributing content to the Learning Center as well. And you don't become a ham radio operator until you become radioactive, involved, and engaged. Somebody told me one time, you know, when does somebody become a ham radio operator? We don't pitch people to become ham radio operators. We pitch them to become interested in radio technology and radio communications. And when they get their license and they become radioactive, involved, and engaged, that's when they become a ham radio operator. So you're not getting started in ham radio you're getting started in learning about radio communications and radio technology. It's an incredible breadboard that ham radio is, right? I mean, tons of pilots get their amateur radio license strictly for the benefit of practicing radio communications and understanding radio avionics even more by becoming ham radio operators. Tons of them do. And there's plenty of engineers who get their amateur radio licenses because they understand that there's a practical nature in amateur radio where people are really experimenting and discovering and exploring and learning. So, so uh, I, I just challenge you all to try a new vocabulary. At what point does somebody become a ham radio operator? That's later. 
In the beginning, you're introducing them to radio communications and radio technology using the gift of this incredible amateur radio service as the breadboard of discovery. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the Aero Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative. I'm the liaison to this program. And um, I wanna tell you that if anybody wonders if young people are getting involved in amateur radio at all, there are tons of them. The, diff the, the, the distinction here though, is that they don't necessarily need us, the older hams in the amateur radio community, because they're having a ton of fun and they're creating a ton of networking at the university level. So every month I work with a couple of incredible member volunteers, the Maluzzi brothers, Andy and to Tony Maluzzi. I love calling them the Maluzzi brothers. You've probably met them at Dayton Hamvention before. They're young engineers who are really uh, representing the collegiate amateur radio community as, as uh, uh, significant leaders right now. Well, every month together we run a webinar and college amateur radio clubs gather with us to just network with each other. Do you know Motorola reached out to us when they found out about this monthly webinar and they said, we have 38 position openings in Schaumburg, Illinois. Can we come to your meeting? Cause we want to hire some ham radio operator, young graduates I said, absolutely. We love making connections for college students that will lead to career opportunities for them. So this is what we do. Um, and my daughter goes to the university of Arizona. One of the pictures, let me see if I can pull that up. There, there's a picture of uh, the radio club at the University of Arizona. And I said, hey, I'm, my daughter goes to, to this college and uh, she's not a ham, but I'd love to visit the radio club when I'm out there visiting my daughter at school. And they said, hey, that'd be great. And I said, hey, could I stream our monthly webinar on, uh, on the campus? And they, they said, sure, we'll make sure everybody shows up. And they did, they had members of the community show up, uh, graduate students, undergraduate students, young men and women who are members of the radio club. And like any good radio club, they took me to their shack and they took me up on the roof of the building to show me their antennas. This is not unusual. There are dozens of these instances across the United States of vibrant college radio clubs doing incredibly good things. What we need to do is support them and find opportunities to, to create connections with them. For instance, we can do a fox hunt where the local radio club and the collegiate radio club get together and hide a, 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 a fox somewhere in the city. And we all work together with antennas that we built to try to find it. In, in Massachusetts, the annual Boston Marathon relies on the amateur radio operators at our colleges and uni universities to round out the number of volunteers that they need for the Boston Marathon radio communications each year. So Worcester Polytech and uh, MIT and um, uh, all the great universities in New England send their college students to the Boston Marathon to help the Boston Athletic Association with the emergency communications at that race. It takes a lot of amateur radio volunteers. And so um, uh, calling upon some of these young people is a super thing but I've also learned a lot from these college radio clubs. At the University of Arizona at Tucson, their radio club has sort of a, 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 a digital checklist on all the things that these young hams should be doing once they get their amateur radio license. Let me zoom in a little bit closer. Along the top of the legend are the licensees in the radio club. Everybody gets a column. You earn your license, you're thrown up there on, on, on a column. Along the left-hand side, along the y-axis is a list of activities that they want you to be engaged in. What a great way to see the progress of each club member navigating their way through the different activities uh, that they've established as the best way to get people active, involved, on the air, so you'll see some examples like check into a net or participate in field day or upgrade your license to general or make a sideband contact, make an FT, FT8 contact, make three of them, uh, build something. We think building is a super way to get people involved uh, more deeply in, into amateur radio. Incredible, this is happening at the university level. 
should we expect nothing more, right? Uh, uh, they function in a, in a place where they're thriving on learning and knowledge building and practice, especially the engineering universities. So I mentioned to you that uh, ARL has published a new magazine starting uh, early last year called On the Air. Uh, excuse me, it is 2020, it came out in January 2020. COVID's messed me up a bit. So I, <laughs> I'm not sure what year it is. I know what year I don't want it to be though. Um, I'm glad to be in 2022. So On the Air magazine is a super uh, way for new licensees to start to earn their groundwork in what they need to get started in amateur radio. We heard members tell us that QST is sometimes over their head. So we invented an entirely different magazine. What was really surprising to us was the number immediately when we introduced it was the number of general and extra class licensees who opted out of print QST to start getting on the air. Not everyone, but a lot of them. And the story that we heard was, you know, I'm a general class licensee, but I've never been on the air before. You know, I'm an extra class licensee. The tests weren't that bad for me. I'm a double E, but I've never been on the air before. I've never built an antenna before. I've never gotten involved in a club before. So on the air is the place where we sort of set the level playing field and say, hey, here are the basics that everybody needs in amateur radio. And we're not gonna assume that you're getting this from a local club anymore because there are good clubs and there are not so good clubs out there. And so we've taken on an element of instruction through On The Air magazine. But we're not just writing the content, we're getting this content from member volunteers who are contributing the content, how to build a dipole antenna. Explain to me how cycle 25 works and what propagation is. How do I program an HT? How does a, what's the importance of a ground for my station? These are some of the topics that we cover in On The Air. And again, I just wanna remind you that if you get QST at home, you can open up the digital edition of this magazine anytime. So I mentioned to you the Learning Center, but we also run regular webinars called the Aero Learning Network. And we published, um, I think we've published around 50 webinars already. And they're available to radio clubs. Sometimes a radio club loses a speaker for the evening, right, Ron? It happens sometimes. <laughs> uh, and for a lot of smaller clubs around the country, they'll turn to the learning network and grab one of the recordings from uh, these webinars. They're about a half hour long and about 15 minutes of Q&A. But for some radio clubs, it's a quick speaker and they'll play one of these half hour presentations that has been previously recorded. And then they'll talk about it for 15 or 20 minutes as a club together. What emerges are who the experts are in the club and who the novices are. And they all work together to learn more about something in amateur radio. So again, in the learning network, we could really use your help to identify subject matter experts. Some of you on this, um, uh, on this uh, presentation tonight are experts and you can help us. And you can help uh, operate some of our webinars for, for us. And, uh, and then what we do is we curate those previously recorded webinars in the ARA Learning Center, where all members have access to those. Another area for, in, for growing amateur radio is to really think critically about how we introduce radio, how we introduce radio. So ARL decided it was gonna take a chance for a couple of years and have a booth at Air Venture, the big show in Oshkosh, where uh, the big aviation show in Oshkosh, right? A lot of people call it Oshkosh, but it's called EAA Air Venture. It's put on by the Experimental Aircraft Association. So ARL had a booth and it was great fun. I put an ARL banner up in the, in the space and 600 pilots signed our guest book and talked about amateur radio with us. And a couple of people recognized the ARL banner and said, oh, I know you, I thought about getting my ham radio license. And it was great fun. That's not the story I wanna tell you though. The story I wanna tell you is that I went into one of the hangars and this group of non ham radio operators was operating a booth called Build a Radio Booth. These were largely not ham radio operators in a build a radio booth. And they weren't building code practice oscillators and, and handing out little sheets with Morse code on it and sending kids away with a 
little beeper, electronic beeper that has nothing, nothing to do with radio. No, they were building a radio, a simple FM receiver kit that happened to be tuned to the busiest aircraft tower in the world for one week. And these kids were all over the grounds of Air Venture after they would build these, tuning in the air traffic control tower, trying to figure out if they could make the reception even better, playing with these, getting a true experience in radio communications technology. They soldered an electronic circuit, they learned about an antenna, they put their hands on components, they tuned a radio. Some of them troubleshooted the radio with the experts in the booth because they uh, uh, down had a cold solder joint or whatever. So they became test engineers that day or troubleshooting engineers. They had a great experience. And we learned a lot from that. One of the things we learned about was who designed this great little kit at, at this air show. Well, it turned out to be two young student engineers, Levi and Kirsten Zima. That's not them on the screen, but two young engineers from Florida in their 20s, not ham radio operators. Well, the first thing I did was help them get their amateur radio license with the help of their dad too. Got them ARL membership. I gifted them personally ARL membership. They're both, by the way, now ARL scholarship winners uh, as they continue to navigate university uh, in, in Florida. And I gave them a challenge. I said, since you did this incredible kit building experience as non-hams at an air show, would you help ARL introduce radio communications through a simple kit building experience? And they did, they worked with us for a year and Levi designed a kit for ARL and his sister uh, uh, Kirsten, who's also an engineer, did the schematics and the part sourcing and ARL took on 500 units that Kirsten and Levi put together for ARL. We bought from them, from their family radio business, 500 of these kits, and we sold them out just as quickly as we got them in. And I have another standing order with them for another thousand now. And it's an introduction to radio communications. This, my friends, is what we should be building with young people. This is what we should be building as a first soldering experience, not a code practice oscillator. There's a parts inventory list so that the uh, builder gets to learn how to identify components and check them off. There's a really attractive um, uh, uh, layout, colorful layout. They learn a little bit about schematics and we're gonna use this as a breadboard for building even more content, video instruction, um, uh, a step-by-step, uh, -step, much like the old Heathkit manuals on how to build it. And then how does the circuit work? So it becomes for ARL, a source of new content. And then we took it to a show. I brought it to Orlando Hamcation in 2020, in February, 2020, right before COVID. Remember that was one of the last <laughs> events on the radar before COVID hit. And we put this banner up in the ARL booth and we said, build a radio and discover radio communications. And we built a couple hundred of these over the course of the weekend and it was a real hit. But it wasn't just kids building it. It was adults building it with, with them as well. It was somebody who's never touched a soldering iron. By the way, that's Kirsten in the blue shirt, the uh, young engineer who helped uh, her brother design this kit. And there's Levi in the blue shirt with another hand who built it. And the excitement of hearing a signal on something that you just built. There's a radio amateur from France who was at Orlando Hamcation who said, oh, I got, I've never built anything. I think I'm gonna build it here. And right next to him are a couple of radio amateurs from Switzerland building, at, uh, uh, building the kits as well. The smiles were infectious because they built something put an earbud in their ear, tuned to the circuit and heard a radio signal. And, and they know more now about radio than most of the population in the United States or in the world. So the second year I was at that air show, I didn't have an ARL banner, just a big diamond in the booth anymore. 
Instead, I put up a banner in the ARL booth that said radio communications, skill, service, and discovery. Yeah, it had an ARL logo on it, but the big message was radio communications. And can I tell you, the booth did 10 times better than the previous year where we were just standing there in an ARL booth because we had a story to tell. We told the general public attending an air show that amateur radio is an incredible breadboard for learning about radio communications. And there's my uh, member volunteers all in that air show booth. It wasn't a big booth, it wasn't a fancy booth, but it was one of the most successful booths I've ever operated that attracted the general public. And we got to talk about all the fun things that we can do in amateur radio to learn more about radio communications. By the way, that banner turned out to be so popular that a member volunteer in Tennessee decided to blow it up on a billboard and it sees a few million people passing on the highway just outside the Nashville area. How's that for uh, a member volunteer supporting amateur radio? And we're looking for more experiences, right? ARL is just hungry to introduce more ways for radio amateurs to become involved uh, more deeply in amateur radio by doing something. So we introduced an NFED half-wave antenna kit that we get from, um, from the Netherlands. Uh, a a mom-and-pop amateur, amateur radio operator over in the Netherlands uh, has a great circuit, a great design for a NFED antenna and he's extremely meticulous. And he does this because um, I'm sure he makes a, a couple dollars from it, but it's a really good deal. And buy these from him, import them, and we resell them as a kit building experience. We sold 2,000 of these last year. He said, you've sold now more than I've sold in 10 years doing this business. And I, and I said, that's the power of ARL is that we can bring an experience to our members build content around it. So we did articles around it. We did a video around it. We may even do an operating event around it. The whole idea was move from reading a book about antennas and actually build something. Some of those collegiate amateur radio clubs have called me up on the phone and they said, hey, Bob, um, the students at uh, Michigan State are heading home for the summer. We want to buy 20 of these for the students so they have something to get on the air for field day and we're gonna build them before the end of the school year. I mean, that's great. That's a super kit building experience. I even built one myself and I took it out to field day in Worcester, Mass. I'm gonna stop there and, um, and just sort of say, you know, this, this is the direction that we're going right now. We can't, stuff our head in the sand anymore and, and say that the end all of, of getting started in amateur radio happens just in our radio clubs. It happens in vibrant radio clubs that are moving people to becoming active radio amateurs. The old Masonic tradition of just gathering for the sake of gathering isn't enough purpose for new licensees anymore. New licensees want to save the world. They wanna know, plug me into emergency communications. I wanna get on the air and make a radio contact. I wanna build something. I wanna understand how radio works. And we're all together in the driving seat of being able to, to, uh, to uh, move the needle on that. So I wanna thank you all very much for the opportunity to talk about uh, growing amateur radio, some of the things that we're doing at Aero headquarters, some of the things that we're doing in partnership with active member volunteers and I can't say enough for the uh, valuable relationship that we have with the Dayton Amateur Radio Association. You all do so much through both the radio club and Hamvention to support the amateur radio community. You support our Teachers Institute for Wireless Technology. Uh, you provide scholarships for young people. You do so much and we're so grateful for this incredible partnership. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I hope that I'll see some of you at Orlando Hamcation. It's not too late to register to be part of the Thursday, February 10th ARL program at the Doubletree Hotel SeaWorld in Orlando. Just visit it, just visit arl.org slash expo. 
arl.org slash expo, and you'll find a super opportunity to participate in an all-day workshop and luncheon that we're holding at the Doubletree Hilton SeaWorld. Then after that, on February 11th, 12th, and 13th, we move over to the fairgrounds in Orlando to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Orlando Hamcation. ARL is going to have a big exhibit there, just like we had a big exhibit at Dayton Hamvention for the National in 2019. And we're looking forward to seeing everyone there. And if you can't make it to Orlando, look for me at Dayton Hamvention in May. Ron, back to you. And thank you so much. Are there any questions for Bob before he gets away from us? No? Uh, I got a couple of quick comments. Go ahead. And I have a microphone. First, Bob, what a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. And the thought of, you know, not leading with AWRL at the experimental fly-in, instead of having that banner with radio communications, that just speaks volumes. Because it's not, you know, the banner that we live under, but it's actually what we do and what we're about. You mentioned that NFED half-wave antenna. Um, I've not bought one, I've been tempted to. I've got lots of antennas and I've built a lot of things already, but I have seen some online reviews. Uh, W2AEW, um, Alan is one of the guys I follow. Um, I'm, I'm a double E and it's just a quick refresher for me on some of the things he does and he puts a neat perspective. But he actually did a tear down and a build of this antenna. I would encourage you if you're thinking about building an antenna or, or any kind of a project, this would be a great one to start. It really is built well, and uh, Alan does a fantastic job just taking you through the process of building the antenna. Um, Bob, what you said also makes me very proud to be the president of this organization. We are doing a lot of the things that you talked about. This month's newsletter, I talked about how our members could get more involved and how they can actually start taking leadership roles more in the club. Um, well, we are a nonprofit. We are a volunteer organization. What we all do makes this club what it is. And we can't do it without you. So this one slews the letter and all these other points, learning, um, member volunteer community. Uh, we have a few members who have not been radioactive. They've been members for a long time, but they're in it for the community. And they're even taking leadership roles. And, uh, I won't mention a name, but there's someone in this room who I would love to see get radioactive and I'm going to make it a personal mission now. So it, does anybody else have any questions or comments for Bob that they'd like to share before we let him on? Jack, thank, thank, you so, thank you so much for those words too. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, I know you well from, uh, from all the hard work that you put in at Dayton Hamvention over the last couple of years. And uh, uh, I know you have a big heart for moving people to be more active in this incredible avocation and hobby and service we call amateur radio. So uh, it takes a lot of people to make a club work like Dayton Hamvention. So uh, your, your, your club is, is uh, the shining star in, in our world at ARL. Thank you so much for that. And again, it's a, you guys also lead and uh, set a great example for the rest of us. So thank you for all you do at AWRL. Um, we do have, I think, a hand up. Ron, you want to get back? Uh, George would like to know what the radio kits cost. Uh, I think the radio kits are, uh, let's see, ARL and Fed antenna kit is, I just quickly pulling it up on our on our uh, our shop. Um, by the way, the reason why we also chose this one is there's a lot of junk ones out there too that burn up if you use any type of power. And we know that a lot of radio amateurs right now um, buy radios that are 100 watts right off the shelf. Right, radios like the 7300 that I have um, give you 100 watts right off the shelf. So. You know why not have something that you can use the full power of your of your new seven or eight hundred dollar radio? Um, I think they're sixty bucks uh, or in that range, um, and uh, and it's a really 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 high quality kit. We used a Kevlar type wire so that they could also stay up as permanent installs. 
Um, I keep one of them for portable use is what I use mine for. So it's, and it's got that no memory type wire so that you can easily roll it up and set it up over and over and over again. So I really like it. It's a great antenna. Oh, were you talking about the radio kit? I'm so sorry. The radio kit is $14.95. I believe it's $14.95. Um, and if anyone's getting a large number of these for some sort of kit building experience, ARL will go to the wall to make sure that um, we take a couple dollars off of that on a bulk purchase. Um, we're not trying to make money on these. We're trying to cover costs and also um, recognize the young engineers who are designing and building these for us. By the way, by the way, on that on that radio receiver kit, um, you need a radio, you need an FM transmitter, right, uh, to transmit a decent signal. If you're in a Quonset hut somewhere and you can't pick up a, a a strong signal nearby, like a radio tower at EAA, so so I bought a seven dollar from Walmart um, uh, FM transmitter that plugs into my iPhone. It's intended for people who want to listen to music in an old car and plug it into the um, uh, jack and, and, and transmit it um, into the, excuse me, uh, plug it into their phone and play, play the uh, weak signal into the FM radio in their car. So I bought it for $7. We put, we are the champions on our iPhones. And after the kids or even adults build them, they tune the radio to pick up, we are the champions. And again, the, the, it just lights up their face to see that they've picked up a radio signal. I have a comment, uh, something you had mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm a, v a VE, and when we have uh, exams and they pass, I'm, I make a point to tell them about the club. And uh, when we do it here locally, and they're local people, I uh, give them the information. At a handvention, when we give tests, if they're local, then I give them the local information. Or if they get home, I I suggest they look look up on the internet to find their local clubs. So I I try to make a point of doing that. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times. That's a very good point. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a city. One of the things I like to do when I'm visiting radio clubs around the country or attending ham fests around the country is I'll drop in on a VE exam. And you know what we're really good at VE exams? We're really good at being very quiet, being very, very quiet. And so people walk in at the ones where walk-ins are accepted, they take their test, it's super quiet, they walk up to the team, they give the test in, it's graded, they get a CSCE, they get a handshake and a whisper and they're out the door. I went to one of these test sessions and I said to the team at the end of the session, I said, wow, that's a lot of people that you got in your club. And he said, oh no, half of these people, we don't even know. They just, they found us through the ARL website and they came because they were walk-ins. And I said, you don't know them. And they just walked out the door. We have to do better at our VE exams. We have to do better. My, one of my favorites was I went to the Disney um, Emergency Amateur Radio Society meeting, DEERS, right? The Disney Radio Club down in uh, Orlando. And they have their VE exam before the club meeting. And at the club meeting, they do a round of applause for everybody who earned their license or upgraded at the beginning of their club meetings. It's fantastic. They also sing the Mickey Mouse Club song at the beginning of their meetings. I mean, you can't go wrong. Any other questions? Again, Bob, thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, and I will be in Orlando, so looking forward to catching up with you down there. Thank you all again. Have a great night, and thanks for all you do. Thank great. you, Bob.